Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 269. This week the questions are taken from guide 332 and 333 on the French steam-powered ship of the line Britannia and the French armor cruiser De Puy du Lhomme, and the Wednesday videos on the US Navy and ice cream barges and the exterior tour of USS Texas in her stint in Dry Dock with a question or two also coming from the Friday video learning about the US Navy in the book recommendation series that I did. So on with questions. The man formerly known as commenting is what I do asks, in the movie Das Boot there's a scene where the U-96 ends up finishing off a burning tanker only to discover there are still crew aboard. Glossing over the fact the movie technically takes place about a year before the Laconia order and that they would be obligated to help the crew and be protected under international law, is the U-boat's crew right in their complaint that the convoy's commander should have organised a rescue during the six hours he was attacking U-96? Is it not the convoy leader's responsibility to rescue sailors from sinking ships, and would failure to do so have consequences? Actually, in a very uncommon thing for Das Boot, this is a bit they get completely and utterly wrong. There are in fact two completely separate chains of command when it comes to a convoy. There's the senior officer for the escorts, or senior escorting officer, and as the name suggests, he is the one who is in charge of the escorting vessels, whether they be sloops, destroyers, corvettes, frigates, etc, etc, etc. So he would be the one who is ultimately in charge of attacking any U-boat contacts, because his ships are the ones that can actually do so. The convoy ships themselves, the merchantmen, can't do anything really against a U-boat short of either maybe engaging it with a deck gun at very close range if it's dumb enough to pop up that close, ramming it, and of course they're supposed to stay in convoy formation. There is then separately the convoy Commodore, who is in charge of the merchant vessels in the convoy. And as part of the merchant vessels, at least after the first couple of years of the war, would be a convoy rescue ship, like the Rathlin, shown here. And as the name suggests, these convoy escort ships were configured specifically with lots of nets and ropes and so forth to enable the rescue of men out of the water, but also with extra cooking facilities, bunks, etc., etc., so that the survivors could be dried off, cleaned off, and provided with food and drink, etc., and a warm place to stay until the convoy got into whichever port it was heading for. And where a dedicated converted convoy rescue ship wasn't available, sometimes one of the more capable convoy vessels would be assigned this duty. However, these ships, whatever specific classification they were, when they were available, were under the command of the convoy Commodore. So if there was some form of rescue ship within the convoy, that would be entirely down to the convoy Commodore to sort out, and the senior escorting officer and the warships would have nothing to do with that effort, specifically so they could go off and hunt down various U-boats and, and such like. Now, that didn't mean that the escorts were completely cold-hearted and would just watch drowning sailors drift past. Quite often, if they were in a position to, the convoy escorts would go and pick up survivors that they saw in the water if it was safe to do so and they didn't have an immediate contact to chase in part because sometimes there wasn't a convoy rescue ship associated with the convoy. Sometimes the convoy rescue ship was positioned elsewhere in the convoy in such a way it couldn't get to those survivors. And sometimes when there wasn't a convoy rescue ship, the merchantman, which theoretically had a responsibility to also try and save lives, would refuse to leave their positions in the convoy to do so, whereas the escorts could do so and were more willing to do so on average. But ultimately, the cold, hard calculus of things was that the responsibility of both the convoy commodore and the senior escort officer was to get the convoy as a whole safely to the UK or back to the States or wherever it was they were going. And therefore, in the event that there was 
no rescue ship available or it was out of position and there was an active submarine contact to be attacked by the escorts, there may be cases where it was impossible to go and save sailors who'd been dumped into the water by their ships being sunk. The logic essentially being that if you abandoned the hunt for a U-boat that had just sunk a ship, and you went to go and rescue people from a ship that had been hit, then what was likely to happen was that U-boat would pop right back up, and it would probably sink you, and it would sink multiple other ships. So it, as it, as a overall net gain or loss, stopping to pick up survivors could in some cases be actively worse, not just for the convoy as a whole, but also for the specific survivors you've just picked up. And German U-boats, even before any Laconia order and everything, had shown themselves not universally, but in significant numbers, to have absolutely zero problem with torpedoing ships that had stopped to pick up survivors of other ships that they'd sunk, both in World War One and in World War Two. So no, the Das Boot complaint is completely wrong, because, to be perfectly honest, if they were playing things absolutely realistically, if the convoy's commander, the guy in charge of attacking the senior escorting officer, had broken off his attack on U-96 to go and rescue crew from this tanker, then, if they're playing it completely realistically, U-96 should have then popped up and destroyed whichever ship was taking on survivors from the tanker. Cliff Bowles asks, Is there any chance of a video about HMS Shannon versus USS Chesapeake? Given that Shannon's story is well known in Canada, she even has a coin, although it's a small action, it was basically Master and Commander, except in real life, minus the deception. It is a duel I do want to cover at some point. However, I'm a little undecided as to how exactly. I've already covered a number of the at sea frigate duels of the War of 1812 in the video I did on USS Constitution, because she took part in quite a few of them. And I've mentioned, you know, USS Essex's duel with the two ships that eventually took it down in the guide on USS Essex. But in theory, it could this could be done one of two ways. You could either do a summary of all of the frigate duels in a kind of at sea version of my Freshwater Lakes version of the War of 1812 narrative. Or I could do it as a kind of a little mini series where each individual duel gets looked at in detail and perhaps one or two of the smaller ones get lumped in together. And that could be done in a chronological order, obviously capping off with President versus Endymion. But one, I'm a little unsure about which way I want to go with that particular series or mini series or single video, whatever it happens to be. But secondly, I've also got to decide what kind of format to do it in, because fortunately or unfortunately, depending on whether you like controversy and people getting very angry in the comments or just reflecting on actual history, a lot of the duels have become exceptionally mythologized to the detriment of both sides in a lot of cases which means that almost any of the more well-known duels, and some of the lesser-known ones as well, including you know, the US frigates versus Shannon, Endymion, Guerrier, Java, Macedonian, etc., are all going to involve a greater or lesser degree of, if you like, maritime myth-busting. And while ultimately none of that actually changes the outcome of the battle, or indeed changes all that much about the determination, the skill, and the capabilities of both crews involved, with the possible exception of Decatur, who really actually doesn't come off that well from an examination of President versus Endymion when you look at all of the evidence, instead of uh, Decatur's own highly censored version of what happened, it is guaranteed to make some people very, very angry, and unfortunately those people tend to also be very, very vocal, which in turn means that in order to make my video not more accurate, because it would be accurate anyway, but more able to defend itself and more secure in its accuracy, I would end up having to do even more research than I normally do for a video.
so taking the Shannon versus Chesapeake example, one of the myths that's grown up around that particular conflict is that Chesapeake was crewed by an almost entirely green crew. So it's often offered up as, for some bizarre reason, an excuse, as if an excuse was necessary, as to why Chesapeake lost. In fact, you know, they're both Shannon and Chesapeake are similar enough ships that assuming reasonably skilled crews on both sides, the fight could have gone either way. Shannon's crew were actually very, very well trained. And Chesapeake's crew were, for the most part, also very well trained. They weren't a bunch of green idiots. Um, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what the agenda of the people who want to say that the crew was green actually is. I mean, I'm not exactly seeing what the upside to saying, oh yeah, well, you know, we lost that frigate, but it was only because, you know, the, the US Navy stocked it with a bunch of mouth-breathing morons who couldn't tell one end of a cannon from another. I mean, that's not shining glory on anybody, really. In reality, whilst there were a few newly inducted crew aboard Chesapeake, a good chunk of Chesapeake's crew were in fact experienced veterans of the War of 1812, who had simply come off of one commission and had signed up for another commission. The fact that they had only just signed up for a commission on the Chesapeake, which was just in the process of working out to head out on a new voyage, didn't make them inexperienced. It's just a reflection of how ships were staffed and crewed at the time. They didn't have permanent crews the way that we would view things today. But in order to make that assertion and go into it in a bit more length in the video, whereas normally I'd be able to just point to, you know, several reference books and say, look, this is where what they say here are where they've sourced this information from. There's enough soft pop history books out there that have just repeated the myth ad nauseum that people can go, oh, yes, but, but, but I read in this book that actually it said they were all green. I was like, yeah, that book was written by nobody in particular. It's probably 32 pages long and contains about as many words. The one I'm referencing is, you know, three inches thick and is written by an acclaimed naval historian, but that's a matter to these kinds of people. So, you know, I might be going on a little bit of a rant here, but just for this video alone, just for that aspect of that video alone, I would want to go and track down the crew list for Chesapeake and then be able to show from that crew list and from other comparative crew lists, exactly how many and which crew had come from previous commissions aboard US Navy warships. But that is a little bit more involved in the details than perhaps is typical for a battle video of that kind. And so while it will eventually get done, it'll be done when I've got the time to actually do that, because that's just one detail in one duel let alone the other details just from that duel, or all the other details that are necessary for all the other duels as well. Christopher Babylon asks, when did turtleback armour schemes fall out with major nations, and why did Germany continue using it? <laughs> well, it seems we're going to keep up this uh, dry dock starting theme of naval myth-busting a little bit, because in terms of other major nations, they mostly gave up the use of the turtleback layout completely by the late 1910s. Now, that might come as a bit of a surprise to some of you because you're thinking, ah, hang on, no, but the US invented the all or nothing armor scheme with the Nevada class. Yes, they did. This is the Nevada class's armor scheme. Notice the turtleback armor. <laughs> or to be fair, I would call this maybe a hybrid because you've got that turtleback armor scheme, which is obviously delineated by having a relatively low mounted armor deck with sloping sides that go in to join at the base of the armor plate. But the Nevada also has this much heavier armor steel deck at the top of the armor belt. Now, later on in the very late 1910s, so when you're looking at the Colorados, Lexington, South Dakotas, G3s, N3s, etc., and obviously subsequent designs for the US and British navies. At that point, they've gone all in with armor on the side, armor deck across the top, but in the 1910s designs, Hood, for example, even the New Mexicos and the Tennessees, you have this scheme where you have still the kind of turtleback protection as well as some other 
upper deck armour protection. The reason why it started to fall out of use with those navies and, well, the only other major navy really in question, the Japanese, was because gunfire ranges were anticipated to get considerably longer and the whole point of turtleback armour, at least in its then modern iteration, which goes back to the start of the protected cruisers, was that shells would be coming in relatively horizontally, with, or close to, which would then mean that this slope of armour, despite being relatively thin, could provide a fair degree of resistance to protect the ship's vitals. Of course, once you got to a point where you're anticipating shells coming in at much higher angles, you'll notice that all that armour does, assuming the shell makes it through the belt, is present a much more perpendicular target for incoming shell fire, which actually makes it worse than having a horizontal steel deck. And thus, the decks started to become completely horizontal and move up to the top of the armour belt. All or nothing actually has nothing to do with what configuration your armour deck is in, in respect to turtle back or horizontal, it's everything to do with where your armour is. All or nothing, as the name suggests, is supposed to concentrate pretty much all the armour you can over the magazines and the machinery spaces and dispense with ancillary armour that is essentially just splinter and HE protection for the bow and stern and is also supposed to get rid of armour that would be too thin to repel incoming heavy shell fire at expected battle ranges, so the less protected upper strakes on ship designs, for example. As far as why Germany continued to use the turtleback scheme, partly it was because the design changes and the reasoning for those design changes that came about in capital ship design, as I mentioned, came about in the latter part of the 1910s and into the 1920s, which was the exact period when the Germans weren't designing any new capital ships, thanks to the Versailles Treaty, which had forbidden them from doing so, and they hadn't really had a lot of experience since doing so, with the exception of the Scharnhorsts. And in both the Scharnhorst and the Bismarck cases, they'd had to go back and draw on the design experience that they'd had surviving in terms of drawings and so forth from the First World War, because they'd also lost, due to inactivity, the vast majority of their experienced ship designers in the late 1910s and early 1920s. We've gone off to other careers. Now, a couple of the bigger myths that have grown up around the Germans continuing to use the turtleback scheme have been, oh, the Germans were designing Bismarck to fight at close ranges against Royal Navy warships in the North Sea, where visibility would be reduced. That's completely utterly ridiculous and complete and utter nonsense. The Germans were not designing Bismarck to fight the British in the North Sea. They weren't even designing Bismarck to fight the British anywhere. They were designing Bismarck at a time when their expected enemy was the French Navy. Hitler had some rather clear policies, much as the Kaiser had had pre-World War I, about not antagonising and fighting the British. The fact they ended up doing so is a completely different thing. Now, Plan Z, okay, yes, that was designed a little bit like Tirpitz's Risk Fleet to challenge the British, but at the time Bismarck and Tirpitz were laid down, their idea was to fight peer opponents, like, say, the Richelieu's. Plus, whilst, yes, there were days like Jutland where visibility in the North Sea would be not quite so brilliant, there are also plenty of other days in the North Sea when visibility is exceptionally far, and it would be thoroughly stupid of somebody to design a battleship for one specific scenario against a nation they're not even supposed to be fighting that relies on weather conditions that are not even completely prevalent in the environment they're supposed to be fighting in. And the German ship designers were not that dumb. The other myth that's cropped up is that Bismarck was supposed to be a giant commerce raider. Again, no. She was designed to fight peer opponents. She was used as a giant commerce raider. That's not what she was designed for. And in fact, both what happened to her and what happened to Prince Eugen on that voyage rather pointed out that if they were designed as commerce raiders, they were absolutely awfully designed as such. I mean, never mind the fact that if you were going to design a battleship as a commerce raider, you don't design it to fight at supposed close-range firefights, which is where the turtleback scheme would actually work, 
because that's an easy way to get your vulnerable commerce raider damaged and slowed down, which will allow it to be hunted down by the numerically superior opposition. If you're going to design a commerce raiding battleship, you want it to fight at as long range as is humanly possible to avoid it being hit in return. Now, that out of the way, there have been defences written of the German use of the Turtleback scheme, which don't rely on these ridiculous myths. And whilst I do disagree with those as well, they are well-reasoned arguments that I just happen to believe are incorrect, as opposed to arguments based on complete fantasy. And at some point, I do actually intend to sit down with one or two of the people who've written the more coherent defences of the German use of the Turtleback armour scheme on their battleships and actually discuss the entire thing with them. Obviously, me coming from a point of view that it was not a good idea and they shouldn't have done it, them coming from a point of view of the Germans had good reasons for it. And of course, we will respectfully try to demolish each other's viewpoints. And then you, the viewers, will get to make your decision at the end of it as to which of us you think is the more correct. Or alternatively, I could take the written arguments that have been made already and try and pre present my critique of them. It basically depends on whether the people involved would like to engage in a discussion on the channel or not. I perfectly respect their willingness if they don't want to. Um, but if I do an engineering critique, I mean, I could do that easily enough. It just feels a little bit you know, harsh to do it all from one side without giving them an opportunity to respond. So there you go. Niels Larsen asks, The most likely proposed design ideas for the Alsace class 1 and 3 each had a problem to overcome. Design 1 needed a triple turret for the main guns, and Design 3 was too long for most of the French infrastructure. From an engineering perspective, which problem would be the fastest and cheapest to solve? Develop a new turret or expand the infrastructure? Well, looking at the previous French playbook, in theory, Project 3 would be the easiest one to do. Because Project 1, yes, it might seem like designing a triple turret would be far easier than expanding an entire slipway. Bearing in mind the French already had more than large enough dry docks. But you've got to remember that when it came to capital ship-sized turrets and guns, as opposed to cruiser size and below, the French had never designed a triple turret that had actually come through to implementation. They'd gone straight from twins, which could be found on the Corbeys and Britannias, straight on to quadruples, as would have been found on the Normandies and Lyons, and were found on the Dunkirks and Richelieus, which would mean they would be in entirely new territory when it came to the design of a triple turret. And it might sound a little bit silly to put it like that, but then when you think about the hesitation that went on when you were upgrading from twins to triples in the 1900s and 1910s, and then the additional problems that resulted when various navies were trying to design quad turrets and weren't the French in the 1930s, actually shifting the number of guns in a turret, whether it be from two to three or three to four or two to four or four down to three or whatever, is actually quite a significant undertaking, which can be gotten quite badly wrong. And then you just have to look at the Iowas to work out that even for a nation that has quite extensive experience in designing triple turrets, they don't always get it right and have to be, you know, rescued at the very last minute by a expeditious and luckily rather successful result of redesign. Comparatively, whilst the upfront expense of expanding a slipway is a bit greater, especially if there are things in the way, it is at least a known quantity. The only thing that's really technically challenging about expanding your slipway infrastructure is paying for it. It's coming up with the money. Well, that and making sure that the water at, at the base of your slipway extends far enough that your newly launched much larger ship isn't going to run into the opposite bank, which is an occupational hazard on some slipways, but never mind. The thing is, though, whilst that is actually a fundamentally much easier engineering challenge, if you were going to build Design 3, Project Type 3 as you can see here, 
it's not necessarily the case that you'd have to extend the slipway much, if at all, bearing in mind that when they built Richelieu, they built her on a slipway that was too short, so they built most of the ship, missing the bow and stern, and when they launched the ship, they stuck the bow and stern on post-fact. You could technically try this with Project Type 3 as well, although you'd have to get a slightly larger slipway than you'd use for Richelieu, purely because there is only so far down at each end of the ship you can go, at least using World War II non-modular ship construction techniques, before launching a bit of the ship, the middle bit, becomes a little bit questionable. The Hand of the King asks, when researching topics or answers for the dry dock questions regarding historical decisions, such as the Japanese decision to attack Pearl Harbor, for example, do you find it difficult not to apply hindsight to the situation when assessing the decision? I find a lot of historical commentary or online discussion groups like Quora or Reddit focusing on the events after the decision rather than the decision or the events leading up to it. It can be very difficult, I must admit, because ultimately, you know, we understand what happened as a result of those decisions, and therefore, almost in a case of, I guess, determinism, because we know what's going to happen, that in a lot of cases is going to very strongly influence us looking at the course of the decision making by going, well, obviously this was going to happen because that is what happened. A little bit of circular logic there, I admit, but still that's what a lot of people do. And therefore, if that decision it leads to an outcome that is non-optimal for the decision maker, people start to very quickly question the sanity of the decision maker themselves. Now, I do strive to try and avoid that where at all possible. Of course, nobody's perfect, but I do make a specific attempt. And in fact, I actually use a technique that I used when I was doing engineering as a day job. And that is simply something actually I learned way back in university, which is that you have kind of the fantasy objective, the thing you'd really like to do. For the Japanese, that could be complete dominance of the Western Pacific in the 1940s, for example. But you don't have all the tools that you'd like to have to hand to do it. You never will, pretty much, most of the time. And therefore... You have to forget about getting to your ideal solution in the ideal way. Instead, you have to look at what is the best solution you can get with the tools you have to hand. And that requires you to then sit down almost in isolation and go, these are what I have to hand. These are the things I can use to accomplish my goal. And based on that, what am I going to do? So back in my engineering days, for example, if somebody wanted to replace a large bridge that went over a railway because the bridge was getting old and also, you know, it, the bridge was no longer with sufficient capacity for the traffic that was going over it, I might sit there and go, you know what, what would be great? It would be a four lane each way bridge with trees down the center, a nice big green verge. A couple of lanes, one either side dedicated to sustainable transport, buses, taxis, bikes, that kind of thing. Nice wide pavements, etc., etc. Except for the fact that that will cost six times the budget that's been allocated to this project. And also the bridge supports on either side are nowhere near wide enough. And if you do widen the bridge that much, you're going to basically knock over a building on one side and flatten half the train station on the other. So you just can't do it. You have a set amount of space. You have a set budget. You can only use set materials. So what is your best solution you can come up with with those materials to hand? And similarly, when you're looking at something like the Japanese situation running up to Pearl Harbor, you have to try and isolate down to, okay, I'm facing an economic blockade on my oil, particularly. I am, have a limited number amount of oil stocks. They're only going to last so long. I'm worried about the US buildup of shipping, so I've got a strict time limit. These are the ships I have. These are the aircraft I have. These are the capabilities I have. This is the replenishment rate I've got. This is the skill training I have for my crews. These are my particular capabilities I don't think my opponent has. This is the speed I think we can accomplish our other goals. 
therefore the best case scenario for us is this, even if it's not a particularly nice one, but it's the best we can do, and if we're going to be forced to do something about it, this is what we're going to try and go for. And when you look at the Pearl Harbor decision in that aspect, now we're not looking at the specific tactics of you know, which particular ships did which wing of fighters or bombers go for and how many waves were there, but just the decision in general to attack Pearl Harbor, it suddenly starts to make a lot more sense, at least from a Japanese perspective. And that's before you start getting into cultural issues about, you know, will the Americans roll over and surrender nice and meekly if they get hit really, really hard, which is a whole other, you know, socio-political economic discussion. And of course, as just mentioned, there's a whole cultural element. Different cultures think differently to other people. So into a, trying to apply our own cultural mindset to someone else is a really bad way of going about things. And there's also just the chaos factor, the misunderstandings and so forth that people often miss, which lead up to decisions, like the whole fact that the Kaiser was absolutely convinced the British weren't going to get involved in World War One, largely thanks to British politicians prevaricating and making things unclear. And the fact he was absolutely devastated when he realised they were getting involved because he knew what that would mean eventually. So with those tools, you can begin to analyse the decision a little bit more rationally. But there are also two other things which I think are very important to point out, and which I have mentioned in Dry Docs before. And it all comes back to the fact that these days, especially when you have these kind of groupthink attempts to analyse history, like some of the places you mention, there is a rather disturbing tendency to try and assume that all decisions must have some kind of completely logical, thought-out, rational basis, and that every decision not only needs to be justified, but justified to the modern mindset of the person who is writing about it, both of which are completely and utterly flawed concepts when it comes to the real life. Now, I tend to count these by two things, which I say you may have heard before. One is the rather brief saying, you know, there is method to his madness, though madness it remains, something which is just applied a disturbing amount of time to things I tend to do in my day-to-day -day life. But essentially it means that, you know, yes, it may look like a completely irrational thought process to you, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is completely irrational. It may make complete perfect sense from the viewpoint of, some, from, of someone who just thinks differently to you. Now, that isn't a judgment on whether or not their thought process is, is better, worse, the same, alternate, etc. than yours. It just means it's different. And you obviously don't understand it unless you stop to think about it for a second. And the other element, which is kind of related to that last bit, is that just because there is an explanation for something does not mean it's an excuse. And people very often seem to think that just because you can explain why somebody did something, it means you must either agree with them or be siding with them or you're trying to excuse their behaviour. Not in the slightest. You know, that's a, a very modern, I'd hate to say almost Twitter sphere, you know, little echo chamber method of approaching things, although it seems to have leaked out of there to other parts of day-to-day -day life. Simply understanding why somebody has done something and being able to explain why they have done something does not in any way, shape, or form condone what they did. And you'll tend to find that once you cut through that, it becomes a lot easier to understand why people did things, even if you completely disagree with or are horrified by them. To use a channel-based example, look at the kamikazes. You know, I do not in any way, shape, or form condone piloting a suicide aircraft into the side of a ship, or anything to do with that kind of behaviour at all, nor do I condone Imperial Japanese ambitions generally, but I am perfectly aware of the relatively cold logic that sat behind the idea of the kamikazes. It was not a completely mad decision by a bunch of absolute fanatics. Now, granted, it did take a degree of fanaticism to pull off in the numbers and organisation that they did with the kamikazes, but the decision to actually carry out the kamikaze missions in an organised and even trained-for fashion has a 
certain amount of logic behind it, which makes sense when you look at things from the perspective of what the Japanese were facing in the latter part of World War II. But, as I said, just because I can explain why they did it doesn't in any way, shape or form mean I approve of it. Comstar asks, so what did the Axis think when they heard the US Navy had ships devoted entirely to making ice cream? Whilst I'm not aware of any direct statements by the Japanese Navy High Command, or indeed even the German Navy High Command, on the discovery that the Americans had several ships devoted entirely to the making of ice cream, I can only imagine that their reaction, had they found out about it, or when they found out about it, would be something like the picture accompanying this question. Because really, when you are in a global war, and you are struggling to come up with enough ships to, at this point, you know, like 44, 45, be credibly called a navy, let alone stop an element of the enemy naval forces that are coming at you, and then you discover that your opponent has gotten to the point where they are even building luxury condiment production vessels in addition to the hordes and hordes of carriers and battleships and cruisers and destroyers that are sweeping your actual navy from the field, uh, yeah, that at that point you're just going to flip tables and walk away, I would imagine. Saturn asks, In the video on ice cream, you talk about how a submarine crew stole ice cream equipment from a battleship. Would it be possible to talk about this in a little bit greater detail? Yep, the victim was the USS Tennessee battleship you can see here. The perpetrator was uh, Commander Richard O'Kane's USS Tang. So, of course, submarines, as was common with a number of smaller US Navy vessels, didn't get ice cream makers initially, or indeed in some cases at all. Submarines, of course, rather warm, rather cramped environments, not particularly pleasant to be around, even by the standards of a war in the Western Pacific. And Commander O'Kane decided, well, this just wasn't going to stand. But if he tried to order an ice cream maker for his sub, he'd probably be refused. And even if one was granted, well, his sub was heading out on patrol pretty darn soon. And if one arrived, it would be arriving while he was out at sea. However, nearby was the USS Tennessee, and he noticed that Tennessee was due to receive an ice cream machine. Battleships, of course, needed more than a single ice cream machine in order to feed their entire crew, so he reasoned, well, it's not exactly like they're going to miss one, but if they went aboard the battleship and took the ice cream machine, it wouldn't take that long for the battleship crew to notice, because whilst the battleship might be larger, and whilst it might be entitled to more than one machine, uh, let's just say US Navy crews were very protective over their ice cream makers. And if the sub crew were caught, then at the very least they'd be ordered to hand it back, and then it would be very awkward. So, to get around that particular little problem, O'Kane devised a cunning plan. You see, Tang had been ordered out to sea on her next war patrol. And so he started preparations for the sub to leave, and perhaps quietly, perhaps not so quietly, potentially with official encouragement, potentially not with official encouragement, of course it's all completely deniable, a small contingent of Tang's crew left the sub, and worked their way aboard the Tennessee, just, you know, pretending to be part of Tennessee's crew or part of the dockyard crew. Again, accounts vary. And they knew where this ice cream machine was, so that indicates there was a degree of prior reconnaissance going on. Or perhaps when they'd seen the orders for the new ice cream maker to arrive, perhaps they'd also seen where it was supposed to be stationed. But in any case... They made off with said ice cream machine, presumably under the cover of some plausible excuse, like it needs to be moved to another portion of the ship, or it needs to be taken off for maintenance because it's broken, or something like that, and very rapidly descended off of the Tennessee, over to the Tang, into the Tang, and pretty much the moment they were aboard, the Tang just happened to be setting sail. 
by the time the guys on Tennessee rumbled to the fact that their newest ice cream machine had gone AWOL and figured out who exactly was responsible, well, they were pretty quick on the uptake, but by the time they'd worked it out and gotten over to someone who could radio the Tang and say, Oi, give the machine back, Tang was clear of the harbour, and unfortunately for any attempts to communicate with them from the shore, she had already dived. I mean, yes, it was a little bit... Uh, preemptive considering that normally you could sail out on the surface but who is to gain say the command of a submarine skipper who might want to i don't know train his crew in some emergency crash diving procedures as soon as the depth of water is safe enough to do so and tragically of course when you are 50 100 200 foot down it's incredibly difficult for radio signals to reach you so any orders like come back here you bunch of thieving insert censorship bleep here and give us back our ice cream machine that might have come over the radio well they never heard them so on they went with their patrol and of course by the time tan came back from patrol tennessee almost certainly would have had another ice cream maker replacement brought aboard and more to the point probably wasn't there anymore john pinkston asks why replace the torpedo blisters on USS Texas at all? Wouldn't it have been cheaper to just not do so? And wouldn't this make maintenance much easier and cheaper as well? It's a fair question, but it does have a rather definitive answer. The simple thing is that, no, it wouldn't make maintenance easier and cheaper for several reasons. Firstly, as you can see in this picture, which is on the port side of the ship's hull back in February of this year, the blisters are covering a large portion of the underwater section of Texas's original hull. So if you don't replace the blisters and you take her back to her original hull form, which would also involve taking off a considerable portion of the above waterline uh, elements of the blisters that have been incorporated into the side of the ship, and then sandblast and paint the hull, you are going to run into a rather significant problem, which now means that the original hull is completely exposed to the water. So any wind and water damage to the hull is going to be to that much, much older hull, which is an intrinsic structural element of the ship, which means if anything goes wrong it's pretty much water directly into the ship, and that is not a good thing. I mean, it's bad enough with you know, the occasional leaks they were having right down at the bottom of the ship. So the blisters, by in and of themselves, flooding in some ways are actually preserving the older portions of the ship's hull. The other reason, which is but actually by far the more pertinent one, is the fact that when Texas was refitted and given these bulges, she was also refitted with a bunch of other stuff, both internally and externally up top, which made her considerably heavier than the original hull was supposed to actually support in terms of her draft and her displacement. So if you don't replace a substantial portion of the torpedo blisters, then you're losing buoyancy which means the ship is going to sit a lot deeper in the water. The stability will also be somewhat affected, but apart from anything else, the ship would actually, as far as I've been told by the guys on Texas, become too deep a draft vessel to actually get out of the floating dry dock, or indeed down a number of the channels in the Galveston area, which she would need to navigate. So by re-adding newer, easier to maintain blisters, it's maintaining the bulk of the buoyancy that they provide to the ship, which means she is st which she'll, should still float somewhere approximating her original waterline. Of course, she's also not got a bunch of ammunition and other stuff aboard, which helps with that, and will mean she can actually get out of dry dock and navigate down various channels and so on and so forth. So, yeah, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, the... Blisters are an integral part of Texas now because of the refit she was uh, given in the interwar period. If you wanted to take her back to the original hull, regardless of any other issues, you'd also have to redo the interior and exterior of the ship to take her back to her old cage mast 1910s appearance 
in order to ensure that she had the correct balance and the correct draft. Brian Smith asks, the US Navy kept the standards at basically the same top speed through their entire lineage. Did the US Navy not know what the speed of other Navy's battleships were, or did they just not care about other speeds of other battleships? The US was aware of the speed developments in other nations, like the fact that the QEs were supposed to go at 25 knots and were actually give a little over 24. The Rs eventually could reach, in theory, up to 23 knots. Some of the German designs towards the end of World War I in terms of battleships were supposed to go faster. Of course, all the battle cruisers were faster. And the Fusos and Isais were a little bit faster, trending towards a lot faster during their interwar refits, Nagato similarly. However, you've got to account for the fact that the standards also have a set of common performance characteristics in terms of acceleration, in terms of turning radius, etc. And the US held that having a common battle line that could maneuver together a lot easier was a more significant force multiplier than having a few ships which would go a bit faster than average, because Ultimately, the Americans hoped it would come down to a battle line versus battle line engagement, at which point a slightly cheaper, more standardized battle line, although cost wasn't in the first priority, it was a priority, would do somewhat better. Because if you think about it, let's say in even the late 1910s, yes, the R-class and the QEs are a bit faster by varying degrees than the rest of the British battle line, but the eight British 15-inch armed battleships are not enough to take on the US battle line, which means that they're going to have to come along with at least the 13.5-inch ships, and the 13.5-inch ships can only do 21 knots. And at that point, the fleet is limited to the speed of its slower ship, which would be the 21 knots, at which point the fact the US battle line does 21 knots as well is perfectly fine. The alternative, of course, is they could split, but and that would require the Royal Navy, for example, showing up with all of its 13.5-inch armed ships and all of its 12-inch armed ships. And then in theory, maybe there would be enough ships to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the US battle fleet and allow the faster ships like the R's and the QE's to exploit their speed to get ahead, cross the T, and inflict a crushing defeat. But if they did that, then the Royal Navy would have just shown up with enough ships to inflict a crushing defeat anyway, regardless of any fancy maneuvers. And with the Japanese, again, if they wanted to come along with the Kawachis and all their older ships, they would again be limited to the slower speed of the older ships. And if the Japanese wanted to come and face off against the entirety of the US fleet at the time they are building the stads, like the 1900s and very early 1920s, with four battleships, the Fusos and the Isais, and then towards the end, okay, six battleships versus the entire US battle line. Well, as far as the US were concerned, they're perfectly willing to let them try because at that point, again, the force is so small that whilst they are fast enough in theory to cross the T, there are so few of them that the US fleet could in theory just turn inside that attempted envelopment maneuver and deal with them with mass gunfire. But US attitudes were changing in the 1920s because it was recognized that if, for example, the Japanese had continued building with the Tosas and Keys, if the British had built the N3s, etc., they would rapidly be entering a realm where the modern capital ship fleet of other navies would be faster than the standards, at which point the standard speed of the battle line would have to shift. And they were preparing for that, but the Washington Treaty came along and obviated the point anyway, at least for a while. Nathpon Hongsheron asks, I watched the Yamato video and I got curious, why did they abandon the all-forward layout? Especially since with the aircraft facilities Megami style laid out aft, it would have allowed them a lot wider arc of fire backwards. The US Navy's design was understandable with their obsession with a fixed percentage of waterline belt length, but what about the Japanese Navy? Also, what's on the side of the 155mm super-firing turrets, and why didn't they just make it like a can with a turret on top? The bits on the side of the 155mm turrets are rangefinders, so they can do their own spotting and rangefinding if they need to. Now, in terms of the all-forward layout going away, there were a few reasons for this, as far as the Japanese were concerned. 
one of the big ones was that we're talking about some fairly serious turrets here, obviously triple eighteens, and they were finding that with the requirements for speed, because bear in mind for a good chunk of this period they were actually looking at 30 knot designs rather than the eventual 27 knots of the actual Yamato class. That obviously needed a significant amount of engine and turbine or in a lot of the designs diesel or both power plants, a lot of boiler space, a lot of machinery space etc. And that meant that the superstructure had to be a little further forward proportionally than you would find on something like a Nelson. So you look at, at this one, A140D, now compare that to a side profile of the Nelson class and you'll see that the amidships section of this design actually, as well as containing the third turret, also contains the superstructure. Whereas if you look at a Nelson, almost one of its defining features is the fact that its superstructure is so far back. And as a result, because of all the machinery space that was needed after to get to the ship's target speed, bearing in mind for a lot of the design they were looking at 30 plus knots, you ended up with the turrets a lot further forward. So we would call a turret or turret one ended up being so far forward that there were serious concerns over with the size of a triple 18 inch turret. Could you actually get the turret, the barbette, the magazines and the shell rooms in whilst having sufficient torpedo defense and spacing between everything? And as you saw in some of the later designs, they were actually even looking at a twin turret forward in order to address this problem, to give themselves a little bit of breathing room when it came to the design. And again, as I pointed out in the video, despite the fact that these were absolutely monstrous super ships, the Japanese were looking at a degree of affordability for them. Uh, they did want to build more than one after all. And so although they went with all forward for a long time because of the savings that the all forward design afforded them, when it eventually came down to what, what turned out to be the start of the final iteration of design, you actually had the triple super firing over twins layout fore and aft, which was then foreshortened by taking out the rear firing twin, at which point it was realized that well, if we don't shorten it quite as much as we would, we can just adjust the locations of the superstructure and the guns and the machinery ever so slightly. And we can now fit in three triple 18s with the full range of torpedo defense, etc., around. And there were some concerns as well about having uh, enough secondary broadside space for anti-aircraft guns and obviously the triple sixes as well. Now, of course, if they'd gone in with the fact from the start that they were going to end up with a 27 knot design with nine guns, you almost certainly could have designed a Nelson style all forward, which would have been a bit more efficient. But because Yamato was coming down from a potentially anything up to 12 gun design at 30 knots, it meant that some of the final design compromises that were made ended up also allowing for the two forward one aft design layout. And there is a small um, secondary, I guess, concern, which was that because these ships were obviously designed to take on multiple opponents, if you have all your turrets forward, that's really, really good for engaging a concentrated battery on a single target. But if you're in a battle line and you're engaging two targets, well, one is probably going to be ahead of you, the other is going to be behind you relatively speaking. You might have both ahead or both behind, but it'd be relatively unlikely that you'd engage on that kind of profile, at which point having a rear firing turret was quite good as having a separate turret to engage your secondary target. The Rogue Chief asks, as a student of sociology and political science, not politics, uh, we write the reports that the politicians ignore, Oh, I feel that one. Um, I really enjoyed reading Robert Massey's book, Dreadnought, Britain, Germany and the Coming of the Great War, for its treatment of the historical naval policy from a humanities perspective, even going so far as to the psycho psychology and backgrounds of key figures. Likewise, I enjoyed Ruger's The Great Naval Game and Roskill's two-part work, Naval Policy Between the Wars, for their similar approaches. Do you have any other book recommendations that look at naval policy from the angle of the social sciences, e.g. sociology, cultural studies, economics, political science, individual biographies, etc.? 
There are a few. So from the Japanese side, the Kaigen um, <laughs> by uh, Petrie, etc., is of course an excellent look at how and why Japanese naval policy developed, which covers a lot of the elements that you mentioned. The book that's appearing on screen, The Development of a Modern Navy, French Naval Policy, 1871-1904, again, another good one. In fact, I'm at some point probably going to use this book and a couple of others as a reference for a video that's going to kind of follow up on my French pre-dreadnoughts video, because the French pre-dreadnoughts video kind of showed how the French built those things. And whereas this book and a few others like it kind of more explain why did they build them, which is just as much of a valid question sometimes when you look at them. But it turns out there were some relatively good reasons at the time. There's The British Way of War, which is a book primarily about Corbett by Professor Andrew Lambert. And there's In Defense of Empire, which looks at the reason the British built the Royal Navy the way they did in the late Victorian and early modern period. There's a series of books by Brian Lavery, Nelson's Navy, Anson's Navy, Pepys' Navy, although I realise that's in completely the inverse order. And as the name suggests, those look into much wider ranging issues surrounding the establishment of and building of the Royal Navy during those periods. That should be a relatively decent list to start with, and of course, feel free to drop me a message if you'd like some additional recommendations. Owen Woodall asks, On the Tone class, why did the Japanese put all the 8-inch guns ahead of the superstructure and none of them aft? Simply put, they were designed actually, believe it or not, as scout cruisers, in a way. You can see from this picture here of Tone that they were designed to support a relatively large air group for a cruiser, and to be able to cycle them, operate and maintain them in pretty short order. In order to do this, the entire aft section of the ship was given over to aircraft handling and operations, which of course would be very heavily interrupted by the presence of a very large gun turret, and even more heavily interrupted by the blast of said gun turret when it was shooting. However, they did still want these things to be heavy cruisers capable of actually fighting, and so they concluded that the only way to do that was to stuff as many guns as possible up front. Now, bearing in mind that the Miyoko and Takao classes, which preceded them, had had 10 guns in five twin turrets, and the Megamis, when they were switched over, would also have five guns, uh, five twin turrets with 10 guns total. This was actually a slight step down for the Japanese Navy in terms of heavy cruiser armor, because they had only eight guns, which was actually in common with a lot of other heavy cruisers from other nations, but nonetheless, they theoretically could have gone with three triples and had an additional gun in there, but the Japanese weren't particularly great fans of the triple turret, and on the fine lines of the Tone, they probably wouldn't have fitted anyway. Matt Kidd asks, were first and second rates necessary to have a competitive battle line during the Age of Sail, or could you have a creditable battle line with just third rates? Sort of, yes and no. The third rate, whether it be the 74 or the 80 gunner, was pretty much the backbone of most major navies, capital ship fleets. It, that is true. And in terms of most third rates versus second and first rates, their lower deck and middle or upper, depending on whether you're looking at a first or third rate, or second or third rate, armaments are very similar. There's a very similar number of guns, and their weight of shot is very similar. So in the British case, for example, at least by the latter part of the 1700s, the majority of 74 gunners, and of course captured French 80 gunners and so forth, had 32 pounders on their lower gun deck and 24 pounders on their upper gun deck. And first rates like Victory had 32 pounders on their lower gun deck, 24 pounders on their middle gun deck, so the broadsides there were fairly comparable. Now, some third rates had 18 pounders on their upper gun deck and some second rates had the same, but that's neither here nor there. It's essentially a broad equivalence. And of course, the upper gun deck of a first rate or even a second rate would usually be 12 or 18 pounders, which means that even though there are more guns, they are lighter. So the overall increase in broadside weight is not as dramatic as you might otherwise suspect. So if you are a small to small medium naval power, you could get away with a battle line that was either predominantly or entirely third rates. That is perfectly true. However, 
the bigger ships, the three-deckers, were built a bit heavier, so they could take a bit more punishment. And whilst that third deck of guns might not necessarily have a huge broadside weight, it was a whole load of additional shot coming your way. And it was shot that was, because of the height difference, coming in at roughly your upper deck level or main deck level, which is not a good thing for the overall life expectancy of the exposed crew up there, your commanding officers, your ship's wheel, the base of your ship's masts, etc., etc. So a first rate, or indeed a second rate, if it went toe-to-toe -to -toe with a third rate, had a significant combat advantage both in long-distance gunnery and at close range, because at close range, those upper deck upper gun deck, I should say, guns, could switch over to grape shot and so forth and scythe the decks of an enemy third rate clear, whilst the boarding parties and so forth on the third rate were relatively free of that kind of encumbrance because, of course, the majority of the third rate's guns either flat out couldn't or couldn't at that range or couldn't easily aim up at them. And then, of course, in a boarding action, if you were in a third rate and you tried to board a first rate or a second rate, you had to work your way up under heavy gun fire, which is always going to be very difficult, whereas they just had to come down to your level, which was much easier, especially if uh, you'd just been shot up by the upper deck guns of the first or second rate. And with that many more shot flying at you, there was also a much better chance you would have been dismasted or at least partially um, had your maneuverability reduced, which would have made it easier for the first rate or second rate to catch you in the first place. So essentially, yeah, you could mob first rates with third rates, but if the enemy had a first rate or two and had, broadly speaking, similar numbers of ships available to them in any given battle, that first rate could hit considerably harder than simple mathematics might otherwise suggest. And that, in turn, would mean that either you would face losing your battle because that first rate might be kind of like a Yamato amongst standards in the 20th century, or you had to build first rates of your own. So it was really a case of if your enemy has at least one first rate, you really need at least one of your own to compete with it. When I get round to covering the Anglo-Dutch Wars, you can kind of see this in the Anglo-Dutch Wars themselves, when you have Sovereign of the Seas, in many ways the prototypical first rate, where, you know, sometimes battles are lost despite Sovereign of the Seas being there, as the majority of the Anglo and Dutch fleets are just hammering each other left, right and centre, but Sovereign of the Seas proves a remarkably difficult and intractable vessel for the Dutch, around which some key actions actually revolve. So whilst the presence of a first rate may not necessarily win a battle for one side, it might very well mean they don't lose, or it could be the fulcrum around which other parts of the battle turn. ACC asks, I'm interested in exceptional ships, meaning those that either dramatically over or underperform compared to the rest of their class. I assume that such exceptional performance is usually the result of a combination of captain and officers, experience of the crew, engineering nuances of that ship compared to others in the class, etc. In your opinion, is there any one factor that is most commonly responsible for exceptionally good or poor performance? And what are your favourite examples of these exceptional performers? For the most part, it is usually crew. If you have a good crew with a good captain and they have a prolonged period of time to work their ship, or if they're you know gradually replacing people, a small contingent are replaced at any given time, which allows the majority to get them up to their standards fairly quickly, you end up with ships that will just flat out outperform not just the expectations of their class, but anybody's expectation of that type of ship. Um, you mentioned in the rest of your question USS Johnston. You know, yeah, a Fletcher class, by all rights, should never have survived as long as Johnston did. Now, granted, there were a few circumstances that helped like, with that, like the Japanese flinging AP instead of HE shells at them, but the leadership of Captain Evans and the compliance of his crew with Evans' orders is a huge part of the Johnston's success. Now, 
HMS Exeter, which you can see on screen here, is probably a good example of both sides of that coin. Because at the Battle of River Plate, despite the fact that she is pretty much almost the smallest heavy cruiser that was around at that point, and she's taking on the most heavily armed heavy cruiser of that period in the terms of the Graf Spee, whilst she does take a heck of a beating, one, she doesn't die, and two, she manages to land most of the hits that will eventually lead to the scuttling of the Graf Spee. So she has good gunnery, an exceptionally well-trained crew, and a crew that hang on even when they are literally forming Chinese whisper lines to relay orders, and captains are standing on top of gun turrets to work out what to do or how to shoot. Conversely, after the Battle of River Plate, she was obviously need a few repairs. She was patched up, given a complete refit, given a whole bunch of new equipment, which ostensibly on paper would make her much, much better. Lots of advanced radar, etc., etc. She's then sent out to a BDA command, and there she actually does pretty terribly, all things considered. When you look at her performance during the various battles that she's involved with under a BDA command, she doesn't hit much of anything, despite the fact that on paper, the new radar, etc., etc., should only have added to what was already a very creditable performance against Graf Spee. But it turns out she also had a completely new crew, and, you know, a relatively green, relatively inexperienced crew with the ship and all this new equipment, turns out they couldn't shoot as straight as their predecessors could, and Exeter was then sunk as a result. So I'd say simply because she demonstrates the duality of both performing well above and well below the expectations for her given class, Exeter is probably my premier example, but there are instances as well where the experience of the crew, although playing a factor, is amplified occasionally by other things, such as particular engineering nuances. You know, if a ship, it, sometimes ships will just come out of shipyards and they've just somehow hit that perfect sweet spot in terms of gun accuracy and machinery reliability and so on and so forth, that then acts as a multiplying factor to the skill of the crew. Now, of course, crew can bring a ship up to have exceptional levels of gun accuracy, machinery, reliability, etc., etc. But if the underlying machinery itself is ever so slightly off or just so slightly given to drifting out of alignment or ever so slightly unreliable and in need of a lot of maintenance to keep it going, that will draw down on the overall effectiveness of the vessel. So it can work both for and against them. I mean, look at HMS Warspite. Now, there was a ship that wasn't adverse to taking a few hits. I mean, she had almost legendary levels of plot armor when it came to being hit by things that might kill her in the sense of they wouldn't hit her. But anything that wouldn't outright send her to the bottom at that particular moment... Warspite seemed to have no trouble attracting those kind of things, like a magnet, <laughs> which, on the one hand, she stayed afloat. On the other hand, it she didn't make it easy for her crew, but she rewarded them with a whole chain of exploits and battle honours that, you know, are the envy of any battle wagon. I mean, you just think of, you know, when she was hit by the Fritz X, I bet you the vast, 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 vast majority of her crew would really rather the plot armour have saved her from being hit by the Fritz X at all. But if she was going to tank a Fritz X, well, then she would tank it and she would survive. Might be a bit of a close run thing, but she would do so. And much as we might like to break things down to rational numbers and so forth, there are just sometimes ships like Warspite, like Enterprise, that seem to just defy all common reason when it comes to their ability to both take and dish out the damage. And that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Next week is, of course, the Patreon Dry Dock. So uh, buckle in, brace yourselves, get a drink, little umbrella, and etc., etc. for that. And onwards we go.